and welcome to another edition of Footnotes. Pastor Mark here, and we are in the studio today with all of our pastors to talk about hospitality. We're going to talk today about what is hospitality. That word might seem strange to you. How to practice hospitality and how to protect hospitality. So guys, let's begin. Biblical hospitality. It is a word that is in the Bible, but so often you don't hear a lot about this word. So let's begin right here. Number one, what is biblical hospitality? We know what secular hospitality is. It's somebody maybe who works at a hotel or somebody who's a concierge or a waitress or waiter. That's not the hospitality we're talking about, biblical hospitality. What is it? Let's begin there. Well, I'll uh, mention a few verses here that, that mention hospitality in the Scripture. So First uh, Peter 4.9 says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Um, Romans 12.13 says, Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Uh, so from some of those two verses, you can kind of see that hospitality is uh, meeting people's needs. It's making them feel welcome. It's loving them like Christ would love them. Um, Jesus in Luke 14, 13 talks about, um, but when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for it will be repaid to you at the resurrection of the righteous. So hospitality is about giving, not about getting. It's about providing for someone else's needs, for you know, sharing a meal with them, making them feel welcome. It's not about how can I advance myself by using people. That would be the opposite of hospitality. And, and that's a temptation for every person. We want to be around people that can help us. We don't necessarily want to be around people we have to help. But yet the Bible calls us in our friendships, in our relationships— to be kind to people, to be welcoming, to seek those out who sometimes can help us, and then to also be open to people who maybe can't really contribute anything to us, but we can be used to contribute to them. Jake, what is hospitality? Uh, hospitality is the act of showing love to another church member. I think that would be, if I had to define it in a concise way, I, I think that's how I would do it because it's more than just being polite and it's more than just inviting people over. It's the idea that as the body of Christ, as the family of God, you are truly trying to love them in whatever way they need to be loved. So if they need a babysitter, you're going to offer babysitting services, and that's coming from someone with a lot of small children. Uh, if they need Is connection— that a hint? Yes. <laughs> Don't anybody buy no. that hint. No. Uh, but— if they need connection and friendship, uh, sometimes they might need someone that they need to vent to and talk about the problems, making yourself available to that. And so it's a it's a broad definition, but I think it kind of needs to stay broad because it encompasses so many things. And and when I I feel like sometimes when the church talks about hospitality, uh, we simply define it as inviting people over to your house, which is one aspect of it. Uh, but it's more than just you know sharing a meal with someone. Uh, it's that idea of meeting them where they are and, and really trying to love them in the best way that you can, whatever that means. All right, so let's take this word, fellowship. How does fellowship, which is a biblical word as well, Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, to prayer. They had all things in common, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, how, what would we say about fellowship, and how does that relate or differ to hospitality? Uh, personally, I would say, um, and I think we've seen this uh, traditionally in the church, I know I have growing up, uh, where fellowship is very, uh, it seems, almost at the surface level, where you have all of these people coming together from different walks of life. Um, but in a lot of cases, again, throughout history, not not necessarily today. I almost think that that's changing in our church, and I really enjoy that. Um, but in the past, fellowship has been this very surface-level relationships. You ask, you know, how is your family? How are you doing? 
um, but you really don't know one another very deeply at all. Um, but I would say the the shift is coming where you almost see more hospitality within fellowship, where outside of the the gatherings of the church where you have that fellowship, outside of that, you have all of these families showing hospitality to one another by opening up their homes and going deeper in relationships where they truly know like how your your families, your marriages are doing, your parenting. Um, you know all of the struggles that are going on in that person's life, that family's life, and you're able to to help and to encourage and to lift them up and to pray over them, uh, to to rejoice with them when they're having triumphs, to to weep with them when they are going through those struggles, and so that makes the fellowship when we all come together even sweeter uh, because of the relationships that are built within the church. So what you guys are driving at is that a fellowship should be deep. It's traditionally been surface, yeah. but it's a biblical term that's deep. Yeah, People need connection. They need community. No one is an island. We need to be together in the church. And one of the best ways to practice the idea of fellowship and connection is the biblical method of hospitality, to bring people into our world, whatever that looks like, whether that's inviting them over, or whether that's caring about them, babysitting, as Jake is hoping for, or whether that's, um, you know, being involved in their life. There needs to be an intentionality on the part of God's people to reach out and and foster connection and community within the body of Christ. I hear this a lot um, at Broadway now. In fact, last night after church, I was doing a membership interview So a new couple coming into our church, and their comment was, and I I consistently hear this, so this is not the first time, but this couple, their comment was, we visited this church, and they named the particular church. And when they said the church name, they looked at one another, and the husband said, is that the church where no one said a word to us? They agreed. That was the church. No one said a word to them. They came. They came for like months. They never talked to anybody. They never got to know anybody. Now, there could be so many variables and reasons, but they just never felt like they were talked to. They said, we came here. We didn't really think about this place. People say that all the time. They say it's so intruding, the building, you know, and it's so big and it's so scary, and we we just never thought about this place. They said, but we walked in, and it was the exact opposite of what we thought from the outside. People were so warm and welcoming, and they talked to us, and they greeted us, and they said hello, and people came up and initiated conversation. Now, I hear that now a lot. Yeah, People are saying that consistently over and over again about the people of Broadway. There is a positive, connecting community, and people are reaching out, trying to fellowship, trying to show some form of hospitality. Um, you know, not to – well, so I, I think that's somewhat new. Would you, would you say that? I, I remember when I first came. And I've referenced this before, but it really hit me hard just as a pastor. I don't, you don't like to hear things. This particular person said, if I was not already in a family here, I would not have any connections. Hmm. And it just cemented in my mind, okay, we're going to do everything we can to encourage this body because I know that's their heart. I know they have it in them. I know they probably think they are. I think every church thinks they're friendly. I've never met a church that said, no, we're cold and mean. Never met a church like that, right? Um, And so I knew they had it in them, and I knew they thought that. So I thought, okay, based on that comment that this person said, I'm going to do everything I can to try to encourage this body to reach out. So we started saying things on Sunday morning, make sure that you've reached out. We started encouraging We started bringing members up to welcome people and read the scripture, and and it did. It warmed up, right? There was just a a warmth that instantly started 
happening. I think was probably already there, but it just was able to come to light and to become more public. I would completely uh, agree with that. Um, honestly, you know, when Hannah and I came here, uh, the church uh, was very warm and loving to us, and and I think they would again have identified themselves as as loving and warm. Um, but I, I heard this, some of the same things about people from the outside coming in. It was hard for them to really get plugged in, um, to certain groups in the church. And, uh, but honestly, since you've come, and again, like you said, we have, uh, we've all been saying the same thing, you know, who can you encourage? Who can you welcome? Uh, make sure that you are welcoming, uh, the person who is coming in from the outside of the church. I mean, that was constant. We were saying that over and over again. And and then also, I would say on the flip side, there's like this growing excitement and anticipation of of the church that we are becoming in Christ. And because uh, we're all growing and, uh, and we're all being sanctified and uh, made more in the image of Christ. And I think a lot of that has to do with our growth and hospitality and really mm-hmm. genuinely caring for one another. And I think what you're pointing out and what I was what what the couple was pointing out to me, every church struggles with this at some point. They right. don't mean to be, but they just look inward. It's very very easy to default inwardly. And I I think maybe Broadway got there because they had a season without a pastor. It was COVID. I mean just easy things that just cause you to look inward and you forget on a daily basis, hey, when we do gather here, it's going to be scary for people that are walking in the first time. They don't know where to go. They don't know what door to go through. They don't, they don't know what class. There were no signs. There there were, there were no signs around around the the campus. So I was like, we've got to get signage because I, I kept thinking, you know, I tried to look at it as an outsider would look at it. And it was hard for me because I grew up seeing this campus all of my life. I taught at SBC. I, I used to work in the maintenance department with Mike Stevenson putting up chairs in 1990 when the sanctuary was in the gym. And so for me, this was like home. So I just, well, of course everybody knows where to go. But I had a friend come and visit. And the friend was going to meet me on Sunday morning. And this man was very intelligent you know, he, he's a he's a two-time doctorate. He's got a Ph.D., oh. and he's got another doctorate in leadership. He is a, a seminary professor, a pastor. So, I mean, this wasn't just, you know, just, and I don't mean that like, oh, he's great. I just mean this is a guy who knows ministry, okay? So he's expecting, like, you know, he, he's not like a lay person that's that's not been in church in five years going, yeah, I don't know what to expect. He's got some level of expectation, and he can look past a lot of things, and I think that's even the better part. So he tells me, I said I said to him, well, how was, how was it today? And he said, well, you know, let me point some things out if you're okay since you asked. I said, no, I want to hear it. I, you know, that's why I'm glad you came, you know, and he just starts giving me some thoughts, and I said, man, I've never thought about that. Like, the first thing he said was, had you not told me don't go in the front doors where the columns are, Mm -hmm. he said, that's where my wife and I would have tried to go. Instinctively, we would have walked there and tried to pull on the door thinking that was the foyer, the vestibule, you know, the, the front of the church. He said, but you told me on the phone, now don't go to the columns because there's <laughs> nothing there. And so he said, I'm, I'm very glad you told me that because that was like my first thought. Yeah. He said, but then I couldn't figure out, well, where do I go? Because when you walk into the, when you drive into the main South parking lot, there's a huge sign in the awning of the school that says what? Main entrance. Main entrance. Yeah. Well, that person is thinking, so that's, the main entrance, right? It's Sunday morning. They don't know. And so he, he was just telling me all this, and I thought, man, you're right. So right after that, I said, we got to get signs on the porticos. We've got to get new signage on the campus. we got to put signs inside. When people walk up, they've got to know, this is where I go. We want to help them. And yeah. that's, a, that's a means of hospitality. It's thinking about 
little things that people are going to experience. It's thinking about people that are not here, and it's being loving to say, how can I serve them when they when they walk into the church? And again, I never notice it. It, it takes other people sometimes to point them out to you. So hospitality and fellowship, they're needed. Everybody needs connection, and it's needed in the church, yeah. of yeah. all places, in the church. Yeah, and I, I think those are great examples of, of kind of that corporate hospitality of what can we as a church do uh, to be welcoming. And, and I don't want to speak for Brady, but I, I think, you know, at the time that we arrived here, I think that that corporate hospitality, that welcoming atmosphere was already in place. It, we felt we felt right from the get-go that this is a very warm, welcoming, friendly church. Um, I think that when we talk about biblical hospitality, kind of those next steps for, for how can we get even better at it as a church is, is we're looking at, well, how do we focus not just on that corporate level of hospitality, but how do we get to that intimate level of hospitality? Because a friendly, welcoming church um, is going to be great. And and I think that's a good segue into the next uh, part it of our is, discussion. It is, and, and that's our second question. But before we get there, I just want to reiterate just the need for churches to have fellowship and have hospitality. Think about all the churches that exist where people just go and they attend, and they're never known. That's a problem. Have yeah. we have we not heard from people who have told us, not only did no one speak to me, it didn't matter week to week if I was there or not. Well, there was a, another example of a family coming to our church, and uh, they were really heartbroken in a sense because they had been visiting here for, I don't know, several weeks, maybe six or seven weeks, and no one from their previous church even reached out to them to say, hey, we've missed you, where are you, that kind of thing. Now, was it Bellevue? No. Because they may not have known. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't Bellevue, no. It wasn't Bellevue. It was a local okay. church, actually, okay. in Soto County. Okay. like And just to be fair, like smaller church or... Larger uh, or a multi-site campus church. Oh, okay. Well, and and I'm just truthfully, yeah, not to not to sucker punch any of those, but if you do go to that, it is going to be harder for people to know you. Mm. So you, it's either got to have systems built in that want to practice hospitality, or you know, that's on you. Like if you join that, just know that very much no one may know that you're there or not. Yeah. That's kind of how they're designed. Just, you know, accidentally maybe or by default or whatever. So you, you have to just keep that in the back of your mind. But we want to be here a hospitality practicing church, right? And so Jake, yeah. as we move into number two, how do we practice hospitality? We know corporately there's simple things we can do to make people feel welcome and loved. But practically speaking, as believers how could how could we encourage our listeners think about fellowship and think about hospitality? I will add, I think that the segment of our church that is growing the most right now, if you look at the numbers, it is the groups that are practicing fellowship and intentional hospitality. So one of the largest classes currently is a class that not just teaches on Sunday morning, but they do things together in their group. They have gatherings. They invite people over to their homes. Very intentional. In fact, one good example, they all had little children, so they said, well, let's all get together on Halloween and do a bonfire and take all of our children together on a little hayride and and honestly, when people come into the church and they realize there's hospitality, there's fellowship, there's connection, and there's a place for me to connect. So it's not just the people that are there have connection, but there's a place for me to be able to connect. That encourages them. And I'm just saying, and we've talked about this so often, that seems to be the class and the group that is, is exponentially growing because people feel connected. So, I don't know. So, what can we do to practice hospitality personally and, and just in our groups? Yeah, well, I think you, 
you provided some some great examples even right there. I, I think the key to it is that idea that you know we're we're kind of trying to focus uh, on that intimate level of of hospitality. And I think that when we talk about practicing biblical hospitality, it, it does need to stay on that that intimate level because when people say things like you know I want to be connected or I want to be known, uh, what they really mean is they want more than just surfal, surface level relations. Yes, surface surfal, level. Surface level relationships. And so even if we have, like, you know, you look at you look at a, the hub before a Sunday morning service, and everyone is is talking and fellowshipping, and they're having a great time, everyone's warm and welcoming, and that's needed, and it's amazing, and that's important and vital. And that is intentional. Yes. We planned it. We, we said, let's take 30 minutes in our schedule so that people have to get together and talk. Yes. and But what we don't want is someone to only have that experience be the only time they're developing relationships because you cannot have an in-depth, personal, intimate conversation with someone really during that time uh, because there's, there's just so many people there. There's so many things going on. It is a more corporate-type fellowship and hospitality uh, situation. And so when we talk about those practical steps, we're trying to help and equip our church to have that intimate amount of hospitality. Because if someone, uh, and not just visitors, but, but people who've been in church for years, if they can establish those true biblical friendships that are sometimes started and at the very least strengthened by biblical hospitality, uh, that makes them feel connected, makes them feel known. It allows us to love one another. And so uh, I think it's it's hospitality is that next step after that warm welcoming to hey we're going to really get to know each other and uh, so you know things like bonfires on uh, Halloween night and stuff like that those are specific intentional situations which allow us to get to know each other in a truer sense. I would say also in addition to that two practical things quickly um, that, you know, we as members uh, can do to show hospitality um, is to first be willing to open your home to host somebody within the church, whether that's a family, multiple families, um, or your Sunday school class, uh, or your D group or whatever, and and spouses. Uh, We've talked about that internally before. Um, But where you are willing to say, hey, uh, I know my house isn't, maybe it's not perfect. Uh, Maybe everything is not exactly how I would like for it to be uh, for people to see. But if you're in a genuine Christ-centered relationship, really that's, that's insignificant compared to the, um, uh, the intentionality of pouring into and encouraging uh, families in the church. So I'd say one, be willing to open your home. The second thing is to, uh, to be aware of who is around you. Um, for instance, uh, Hannah and I were eating in our Wednesday night meal, which I'll say this is another great time of fellowship because there are a lot of conversations that happen around the tables. And and let me just throw in, yeah, that's intentional. Mm-hmm. We used to charge and it kept people away and people sat in groups, mm-hmm. but we we did we threw the Bible study in there. We said it's free. We got more people to come intentionally. Yeah. So that people will eat together. Okay. Not not to date this podcast, but this past Wednesday night, I mean, even the the fellowship hall was was packed, full of people, mm-hmm. uh, having these wonderful conversations. Um, so you were at the table. But and- I was, we were at the table. Uh, this didn't happen this week, but one week, um, and a family sat with us, and we we invited them. They were uh, a newer family, and uh, we Hannah and I are are currently fostering. And it, it turns out, as the Lord would have it, that this couple who sat at the table also are foster parents. So immediately we were able, just by being open to, uh, to visitors and, and inviting them in, we were able to have really good conversations about similar walks of life that are very unique. So I would just say be willing and open, uh, or be willing to be open to those who are around you. Yeah, I think that's a great a great illustration and analogy. Be aware. Yeah. Look, look around. Who needs somebody to sit with? Who needs an invitation to a class? Who needs 
you know, that nudge of encouragement. Mm -hmm. And when we see people sitting alone, be intentional. So one of the things I've tried to do, and I'm still trying to do it, and this is a good problem. It's getting harder as we get bigger. But on Wednesday nights, I, I typically don't eat, and I just walk around to every table and say hello. I might just say hi, or I might stop and talk to a couple of girlfriends like Miss Charlotte. You know, she's yeah. she's a girlfriend, and she's going to want me. Uh, now, Miss Charlotte is, is an older lady, older saint, precious. Love to hear her laugh. And uh, she, she'll stop me, and I have to talk with her because she likes to tell me things. Yeah. She likes to tell me jokes. So, you know, I, I try to make my way around, but I, I typically will get stopped. But, but it's intentional. I'm not going to eat because, A, I don't want to because I've got to teach the study. But, B, I want to just walk around and say hello to people and have that opportunity. And you said you thought that made a difference. Uh, now, this has been like two years ago, but you said, I really think that makes a difference. You walking around intentionally saying hello to people who are sitting at the tables. So I just kept doing it. I thought, OK, that's good. That's an intentional awareness. Hopefully everybody's going to get a hello. They're going to get a touch. You know, they're going to get something. Yeah. You know, so we can do things like that as staff. But the church has got to take responsibility we can't plan everything. So we have planned many things. We right. have the 10 o'clock, 30 minutes. We have the meal on Wednesday night. We, we even have D groups. We have the women's ministry. They have some small groups that meet. We have the men's ministry. They have some small groups that are meeting. You know, for example, I've got a, a group of about 10 men that are meeting at my home every Sunday night on the back porch. Cold or hot, the joke is, doesn't matter. We're going to be sitting out there by the fire pit, and we're going through James, and that is good fellowship. You know, that is very intentional. I'm trying to bring these men that are new to the faith and new to the church into my home so they have the opportunity. I've tried to do that with the old care group leaders, with the deacons, yes. bring them into my home. And really, it's not just the pastors that should be doing that. We all should be doing it. Mm -hmm. We all should be saying, hey, who could I invite? And if if you're scared and you think, well, my home, oh, I wouldn't have time to clean it. Well, then invite them to eat. I mean, just say, hey, you want to go get yeah. food after church tonight? I've done that, and I've had sweet fellowship with people who are like, you guys want to go out to eat? Or how about Friday night? You know, there's there's always those opportunities. It's just practicing fellowship, practicing hospitality, reaching out to people to try to encourage them and make them part of the body. Yeah, yeah. and I think, uh, you know, just to reiterate, it doesn't have to always be, you know, around a meal or anything like that. I think that's kind of our default. But one thing that has blessed us personally uh, has been— You're going to say babysitting. Not no, babysitting, no. Uh, but there are a lot of young families, and, and one of the things that uh, we're able to do through all these small groups and Sunday school classes, uh, oftentimes they'll have like a group me, which is just a large group conversation. And one of the things uh, that we're able to do is if um, if Lindsay's going to take the kids to like the Children's Museum in Memphis, you know, she'll put out a message, hey, we're planning on going to the Children's Museum Thursday morning, is there anyone who'd like to come with? And it's just this open invitation. And when enough of those go out there, it just fosters opportunities for people just to live life together. You know, it doesn't have to be a specific, I'm going to invite this family to a meal on this day. It can be something like, hey, does anyone want to come and, and have a bonfire? Uh, we're going to do this activity as a family. Are there any other families that want to join us? And those kind of um, just open invitations show a lot of hospitality uh, to people and, you know, uh, just allows people to get to know each other outside the walls of this building. Yeah, absolutely. So it could be working out. I know some of our people do that, you know, and invite people. It could be going to a movie. It could be hanging out at somebody's house on a Friday night. It could be church, whatever, practicing hospitality. Just a few more ways. Could we give some practical ways? Brady, I can just see it all over your face. You're ready to tell us some practical ways of how to practice this biblical hospitality. Yeah, I would just say um, look at your schedule, maybe carve out 
a night that you could be like intentional, like make, make it a habit. Don't just kind of, you know, if you practice hospitality once a year, are you really that hospitable? Right. So like, is this a regular habit that you do as a family? Is there so you know, me and Lauren, every Thursday night, we try to, is there someone we can invite? Who could we invite over to our home? Or if we're doing something like Jake said, thinking not just about your own schedule and your own self, but who could join me in this? Um, but I think the regular habit of it makes it where it happens more often. And you start thinking about, oh, what about this new couple? Has anyone ever invited them over? Is, have they felt loved? So you start to get in the habit of thinking of others who need hospitality. But if you just do it occasionally out of guilt or something, then it's you're not going to do it. It's a lifestyle of hospitality of how can I think of others, their needs? How can I meet uh, what they need? And not about how can I, you know, like we read that verse that Jesus says, it's not about who who in the church can I find and be friends with to advance myself? That's the opposite of hospitality. Hospitality is who's in need? How can I meet their need? How can I make them feel welcome? And and, and there's a lot of lonely people yeah. in the church. The need is great. Yeah, there's... You know, Brady, I'm going to out us, but we, we've talked about as newcomers, and we've said this among ourselves, you know, you and I particularly, that at times it's lonely. It's It can be lonely, and we're not whining. It's just, you know, you've moved. It's a different place. You know, you don't have the same people you had in your life. People don't mean to be that way, but it, it can be. Now, I've noticed you and Lauren, and of course, Brandon, you do this too, and and I think the two of you are better at it than maybe Jake and I, and I'm not saying that. I just I just know in my season of life, we have four teenagers almost, and we feel like we're always going, and we're never stopping, and we're always going here. We, we live on this campus, and that's great, but it's hard to carve out those moments. So I'm so thankful I have Sunday night with these guys because that's like a rarity. I'm going all the time. But, you know, you guys, tend, and Jake, you're in that phase where you have all these little kids and a baby on the way, and, um, you know, you've said, I'm in a smaller home. It's harder for me to do that. But you guys have done it pretty well. And um, give some examples of just what you've done. And so I'm asking you to toot your own horn. I mean, uh, we just, I try to, well, so Lauren's obviously the preschool director. I'm the pastor of families. So our first intention is to get to know the families that we're directly ministering to, shepherding. So either, you know, trying to get to know the families who have kids in the first through fifth grade or the young babies or toddlers that are under Lauren's ministry. So that's who we're strategically trying to invite uh, the most. Um, and so we had like the whites over uh, last Friday, I believe. Um, so yeah, Thursday, Friday. So we just try to, yeah, intentionally text someone and say, hey, we'd love to have you over for dinner. You don't have to bring anything. Just show up what time works for you. And you have two um, little kids, so I want to point that out, which means life's hard. You have an infant right now at the time of this recording. A three-month-old and a two-year-old. Yeah, so. so nobody could accuse you of, ah, you got it easy. I mean, it's hard, uh, but you're driven to do this, right? So what does that look like when they come? Yeah, I mean— You know, is it is it— good is it weird is it no it's good awkward? I mean, so again strategically lauren will try to do like a meal that's simple you know crock pot meal just throw the whatever the pot roast in the the, the uh, crock pot and it's simple and um, we usually you know eat pretty soon when they get there and then we go to the move to the living room and just kind of fellowship just talk about life the kids will play with the toys or whatever and then uh usually we ask you know kind of spiritual questions and then you know we'll try to end the night like, hey how can we be praying for you guys and then we usually try to pray with them. And then usually they stay for about two hours and then the kids need to go to bed and all that stuff. When we were back at Kansas City, we had no kids. The problem we ran into is we didn't have any, we'd invite couples over who had kids and we weren't parents yet and we didn't have any toys. And so the kids would like play with potpourri and decorations and start throwing <laughs> and stuff that wasn't toys. Like, Knives oh. and they were like, kinds of good things. Like, oh, we probably should get some toys for people because we didn't mm -hmm. know. We were, weren't parents. But now we have all kinds of, Henrik has oh, invaded our house with toys, so there's plenty to play with now. But yeah. So yeah, it's not rocket science. It's just, do you value hospitality? Do you want to welcome people into your home? Are you going to make time for that, right? If we had – now, it might be harder when our kids are older and there's a sporting event every single night for four hours. I don't know how. And and that's kind of that where – works. Well, but, you know, one has band, one you know, has drama, you know, one has dance, and one has football. And you're yeah. trying to go, okay, 
and then my wife's the cheerleading coordinator for seventh <laughs> and eighth grade or, or whatever. And and so she's up at the games, and then I've, I'm frying French fries, and it's like, when like yeah. when do we have time just to be together as a family, much less this hospitality? But we do intentionally try. I mean, we try. Mm-hmm. We we try to reach out to couples. And I try to be considerate of my wife, like, well, look, if it's busy, let, let's just go out. Yeah. We'll, we'll all go out to a restaurant, and you don't have to worry about the house. You know, and, and so by God's grace, we've had people. One of the things we've also tried to do over the years, and, and this is just an example that's simple, Easter, uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving. Now, this, this was our family. This is what we wanted to do. We'd always try to find people who didn't have anywhere to go. Maybe they don't have family here or, you know, they're, they're widowed. And we would say, we'd love to have you at our house. And, you know, first Easter here, we had a, a single person come to our house. Uh, my beloved mother came, and so I don't know if they'll ever come back. But <laughs> gosh, Because that was, that was just interesting all in itself. I think it shocked them. But, um, you know, they came, and it was, it was just you know, we tried to just reach out and say, look, you don't have anywhere to go. It's Easter Sunday. Why don't you come to our house? And we've done that with, with several people uh, over the over the cut last couple of years. So there's always things we could do. Mm-hmm. But I love what you said. Just be committed. Be willing to do it. Be willing to try. It is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you prep. It's going to cost you a clean house. But you will get to know people. And I think it's a blessing. So yeah. I was going to say, um, you know, for me, it's it's actually a lot harder than for my wife, Hannah, who I believe truly has the spiritual gift of hospitality. And, and it, is a, it is a spiritual gift. gift. So, and it's also a command. I mean, we yeah. see not only is it a spiritual gift, it's something that, you know, and we've talked about spiritual gifts before on the podcast. And I think Jake is actually the one who mentioned. But these are things that, you know at face value, I mean, they may make us uncomfortable. Like we may be uncomfortable in showing the gift of hospitality, but if we have the spirit of God living inside of us, he will enable us uh, to show that gift of hospitality um, and move us past our our comfort zone or our comforts um, to, to go out of the way and be intentional in those ways. So I've seen that in Hannah's life, and that is actually the Lord has used her to help me see my need to be aware of other people. Yeah, I definitely yeah. have seen the gift of hospitality in you guys. In some hard seasons of your life, you still had people over. Mm-hmm. And I would go, man, I just feel horrible because I feel so busy. But I do think you make a good point. There are some people who have the spiritual gift. They can just do it more and maybe they can even do it in a better way, but there is still the command. So just like every spiritual gift, you know, the gift of giving and the gift of, of teaching, we all have that to some respect as a command, but others of us have a greater degree of it, and we may have the gift that enables us to edify the body of Christ in a greater way. And I've certainly seen people with hospitality. I mean, they just they just make you feel warm and welcome in their home, and you are loved, and you are encouraged when you go there and you think, man, I, I always want to come here. Yeah. So I'll mention one thing, Brandon, you let us stay in your house up in the guest room above the garage, or whatever. Oh, yeah. I think, I think when we were coming in view of a call, but I remember a detail, like, and I guess this is Hannah's gift of hospitality, but y'all had like a little basket full of snacks, like, and water and like food, like they had anticipated our needs, like, oh, they'll probably be hungry. They just got in late, you know, so things like that are our hospitality. It's like, what will these people need? How can we provide that for them so we don't have to ask, like, we're hungry. We just got, you know, an eight-hour drive from Kansas City, and here there's some cheese its for me to destroy and some bottled water. Like, that was just like, this is amazing. You know, like, this is mm-hmm. – that's hospitality. Brandon, you never bring me a basket. <laughs> yeah, you, don't stay, yeah. you don't stay in our yeah. upper room. Yes. So. Uh, I'm going to need that hospitality. Yeah. 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 Where's my Cheez-Its? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Mark, one other thing you, you mentioned I think we should – probably circle back around to since we're talking about practically like how can can we practice hospitality uh, as a church and as individuals uh, you know you mentioned uh, in, in your particular season of life and I think that we all understand what seasons of life are we all understand that everyone has different schedules and obligations and it is true that throughout 
your life. There's going to be periods where it's easier to host than than at other times. And, and I think that's a really good example for why we as the pastors are, are saying that this is a discipline that not only are we all trying to individually get better at and work at and grow in our lives, but we really need the church as a whole to grow it as well. Because the truth is, uh, you know, even if we had a family over at, at every one of our houses on every available night, we would not be able to get all of our members uh, connected. We would not be able to show true biblical hospitality to everyone with with just the four of us. And so I'm just thinking about even connecting like with with youth families, you know, the um, the the difficult thing that Lindsay and I run into with trying to uh, host and invite people over is because uh, they have games like every night. Their uh, their sports and their school and their schedules are busy. And so uh, I remember a conversation we had a few weeks ago, and, and we were like, well, when would be a good time? And they said, well, what if we came over Monday night after the basketball game, like at 8.30? And it was like, hmm, okay. We'll do that, and we'll get we'll get coffee. But I'm thinking, like, all right, this family is, is coming. They're they're bringing their kids. All of my kids are going to be trying to be put down to sleep at that same time. My pregnant wife is going to want to be getting into bed, and and it was a, a difficult thing trying to get that scheduled. On the other hand, uh, us showing hospitality towards some of the younger uh, church members who have brand new kids, honestly, is is just a lot easier in that season of life because. Our kids have the same nap schedules, and so it's really easy to, to coordinate those things. And so one of the disciplines that we're trying to develop is not only for each of us to be hospitable, uh, but for us to recognize that each of us are uniquely equipped to be able to reach out to people who are also in the same phase and the same season of life. Um, because the truth is it, it is easier for couples with teenagers to reach out to other couples with teenagers. They might be playing at the same game. Uh, it is easier for couples with young babies to reach out to other couples with with young babies. And so this is something where if we want to reach everyone with true biblical hospitality, uh, you know, from, from age zero to 80, if we want to be a church that's growing in every category, right, then we need people who are showing biblical hospitality, real hospitality, uh, in every age range, to every family, in every season. Uh, and I think that, Brandon, your example earlier of being able to to have a conversation with a family who's also fostering is is such a unique thing because, you know, Lindsay and I don't foster, and so that's a point of connection that we wouldn't be able to share with that family. But God has placed uh, you and Hannah in that unique situation so that you can show hospitality, I would say, to a a greater degree in that situation to that family because you have that point of connection. So each of us are in our own situations. We know people get get busy and there's a lot of competing things, but each of us have an obligation to show biblical hospitality to the church or else there will be some people, especially at a church this large, that could fall through the cracks. And, and as pastors, that's something that we desperately do not want to happen. Yeah, so who can you reach out to? How can you practice it? Those are questions every member should ask. Who can I say hello to? Who can I invite? And it's amazing. Most evangelism, most people coming to church typically come through the invitation of a friend. So if a friend says, hey, I'd love for you to visit, and I'd love to sit with you, I'd love to invite you, it just it just transforms everything. And that's that's also true inside the church. Okay, let's go to number three and our final question. How do we protect biblical hospitality and fellowship and community in the church? What are some things we can do to protect that biblical community? I want to start, and I want to say this. I think, number one, we have to continually say to one another, we all have to just do some self-evaluation. Is my box open to new people. There's, there's a lot of people, even in this church, that have been friends for a long time, and that's great. You are blessed, and that is, that is a blessing of God. But here's the reality. The seasons of life, Jake, that you mentioned, friends are going to come and go. Now, maybe they haven't in your life. You are the exception more than you are the rule. 
and and the people that I was closest to in high school, they still live around here. Some of them don't want anything to do with me because I'm a preacher. So, you know, that those friendships have been severed. Um, th- there's people, you know, just because of busyness and they're living their life and their kids are at a different phase. We love each other, but there's just not a lot of connection there. It's hard to try to connect. People in your life will come and go, and you've got to be open-handed. People are going to move. They're going to take job offers, and and things are going to happen. And that's where we cannot treat our friendships like marriage. We're married to somebody, but you know we all say, "Well, I've got a best friend, and this is my group, and all that." To me, the cliques, the groups that have no room in the box for anybody else, they are actually. What Kelly Needham in her book Friendship uh, would refer to as divisive friendships, divisive friendships. So we have to be careful. I love this book by Kelly Needham. The pastors are currently reading it right now ourselves to just familiarize ourselves with what is community and hospitality. And I would recommend it. It's in our book nook, so you can always go and pick it up. But Needham mentions three different types of friendship that we need to avoid. These are signs of selfishness. She talks about the demanding friend, and this is somebody who feels entitled, and they're very demanding, and they have a lot of expectations on you, and there's tab keeping, and they get angry when something inhibits the friendship. Okay, there's demanding friends. Now, I'm not talking about that necessarily. But then Needham in her book says there's divisive friends, and divisive friends foster disunity. Now listen to this quote. This is page 49 of her book. I think this is great. Being divisive also means hesitating to welcome new people into the mix. New people throw off the equilibrium and threaten our position with our friends. And when our stability is found in our friendships, we form cliques and we protect them. So being divisive means we don't befriend people who we think cannot benefit us, the poor, the elderly, the outcast, the handicapped, or we may be willing to pursue friendship with people who aren't like us, people who require extra work to get to know. If friendship is all about us, then we'll find the easiest route to get what we want. Man, divisive friendship. I think accidentally in churches, divisive friendship forms with groups. It could be care groups. I'm going to be honest. Why did we end care groups? COVID. But one of the major reasons I heard from way too many people, way too many, not one, not two, but over 10 different types of people who said, I tried to go to a care group, nobody talked to me. I tried to get in this care group, it was clear I wasn't in the clique. I tried to get into this care group, they had been together for 20 years, I wasn't invited. One person even told me that they went to this care group on a Christmas party night, and they were telling me this story, and I'm trying to remember who this was, But basically, they were told when they walked in, now, this is a Christmas party, and so this isn't for you. Now, I think they were trying to be helpful, but they were like, this isn't for you. So you can watch, but you can't participate in the game exchange. We we don't have a game, you know, we don't have a present for you and all that. And I'm just thinking, who says this stuff? You know, like, I would be like, you know what? You can have my gift. Here, why don't you play? You know, make them, people came to your home. They like wanted to be a part of your group and you don't have any room in your box. And after I heard like the seventh person say that, I thought, okay, we don't have care groups. We have click groups and this has to end. And so we gathered all the care group leaders together in my home. This was 2020 and I just was honest with them. I said, look, this is what I hear. Let's talk about it. They gave me their feedback. A lot of them admitted, yeah, we didn't mean to, but 
it kind of became that way. So we were in the midst of COVID and it, it just naturally had ended anyway. And so my solution was right now, let's not start that back. Let's wait. Let's see where the church goes. Let's try to foster intentional hospitality and community. Now, again, I'm not saying, and I want to be careful because there's always critics that are listening. And I want to say, I'm not saying every care group had this problem. I'm sure there were great care groups that fed the poor and clothed the needy and did everything under the sun that Jesus commands them to do. And so kudos to them. But I am saying honestly, I want to say that honestly. I'm not going to lie. That was an issue. And as a leader, it's my job to shepherd the whole flock. I listen. I talk to people. That's my job. It's my calling. When I see a problem, it may be uncomfortable. It may not be what people want. But if it's the betterment of the healthiness of the body, it must be done. It must be done. So we just needed a little bit of corrective surgery. We did that. So, you know, I don't think, you know, people even think about it anymore. But but in the beginning, again, we brought the leaders together. My house had an honest conversation. Some of the people said, I'm out. You know, not going to do that if we don't do care groups. Okay. Well, I understand. But this is the direction we're going. And we want your buy-in. We want you to know about it. We want you to understand why. We want to give you the opportunity to tell us anything we need to know right here in my den because this is what we're going to do going forward. And we made that decision. And it's not that we may not do it again, but we made that decision. Why? Because they became clicks. The box wasn't open. And I don't think people meant to be, but they they became divisive friends. I don't know. So that's one way how we protect hospitality is anything that's divisive. And I would even say that, look, if you're out there and you got a Sunday school class that says, we don't really want anybody else in this class. We all have our assigned seat. That's divisive friendship. You can't do that. I would say the same thing about pews. I would say the same thing about everything else. You can't, God commands you. You can't be divisive. You got to be open. The box has got to be open you got to be willing to say, I'll let other people in my box. I would say another thing um, that the church uh, is doing as far as like the pastoral staff together um, in protecting the hospitality and fellowship of the church is by not overwhelming the schedule um, or over planning. Um, you know, the church is not a robot. Um, it is not something to really be programmed it is an organism. So it is about uh, organic relationships growing in the church and being led to, again, the glory of Christ, to to live in such a way that would honor and please Christ. So everything that we do, and, um, and we've talked about this before on the podcast, even in conversations, I know Pastor Mark has said this from the pulpit multiple times, everything that we do, everything that we plan is intentional. It's intentional for... Uh, really laying a foundation on which to build strong, healthy, Christ-centered relationships because we we believe that the church itself will grow more and more healthy as those organic relationships form within the body of Christ. Um, so we will not over-program uh, or, uh, again, just pump stuff into the calendar. Um, we are intentionally thinking about, does this event... Uh, promote relationship building and hospitality and fellowship and all these things. Yeah, that's a good point. We want to give you time. So yeah. people say, well, we don't have Sunday night anymore. No, and that's the perfect time for you to invite people over to your house, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing programmed unless you're going to a small group, men's or women's or whatever. But what a great opportunity for you to take initiative and do something. You, you're so busy through the week and you're like, well, I don't have time. Sunday night. Now we've given you time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think over programming is uh is a trap that a lot of churches fall into with the best of intentions and uh I, I do think you see that um especially at some of the uh larger churches as the church gets bigger it tends to program uh more and more things but often it's those churches where people will give us the feedback that they felt disconnected and I think that's because 
in a church-programmed ministry. You can have that corporate fellowship and hospitality, but again, you can't have that intimate hospitality. And so that's the thing, that's something that we're trying to protect and encourage that, you know, if we if we had a big giant fellowship every single Sunday night, we could have more corporate fellowship hospitality, but we would not be providing the opportunity for people to have intimate hospitality. Now, whether people take that opportunity and use it for the glory of God is is something else entirely, but we want to be able to say that as a church, we are trying to allow our members to grow in maturity, and we're trying to help them in that process and developing that spiritual fruit um, of biblical kindness, love, hospitality, and providing opportunities for fellowship is something that, talking about intentional, we are intentionally always trying to do as pastors. Yeah. So bottom line, be hospitable, seek out fellowship, be in the community, in the church, gathered, and uh, connect with one another. That's a good exhortation, right? So we hope that you'll consider it, that you'll practice it, and that you will protect it. And on that note, let's go fellowship and eat because I'm starving. So hey, Brandon, where are we going to go eat? Well, if we go if we go to Brandon's house, he'll have snacks laid out for we're us. We're going you know, we'll to have, your house. Where are the cheese? And we're going to have, have gift the baskets. baskets and the gift basket. Everything. That's what we're going to eat. On that note, we'll end. Mm-hmm.